name is Naeem Ali. I'm the host of this webinar on CBTC standards, concepts, and, and architectures. We're going to cover several topics. The first is I'm going to start off with defining what CBTC is. Um, just a basic definition. It's going to be based on IEEE 1474.1. Uh, and we'll define what CBTC is and the and and the uh, the basic definition of it. Uh, we'll go into types of signaling. There are two types. One is fixed block signaling, which has been the traditional way of doing signaling for the last 100, 140 years. Uh, and then the CBTC moving block concept uh, for signaling, which is really it it's uh, been used over the last 30 years and really has taken off over the last uh, 15 years. So I'll define the difference between the two the advantage and disadvantage between them um, and why moving block is, is the way of the uh, future. Uh, we'll go into CBDC movie, uh, building blocks. These are the, the uh, basic uh, functions that are required for a CBTC. It's based off of IEEE 1474.1 uh, and we'll talk about uh, ATP, automatic train protection, ATO, automatic train operation, and ATS, automatic train uh, supervision. We'll go into uh, the architectures. Uh, there are three types of architectures, uh, one with a CBI, one without a CBI, and finally a train-centric architecture. This is again based on IEEE standard. Uh, most of the industry is using one of these architectures, so I'll briefly, I'll describe what these architectures are uh, and some of the advantages and disadvantages. And finally, we'll finish off by going into uh, some detail uh, with the standards, 1474.1, .1, and 0.3. Um, and then we'll finish off with the, with the conclusion uh, for the webinar and then address questions that, that you may have. So acknowledgements. I just wish to acknowledge Dr. Mukul Varma. Uh, he reviewed my presentation, uh, gave me some valuable feedback. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Verma uh, for, uh, for his review and, and, and the feedback that he gave me, as well as Ajay Singh. He's with Alex Academy. He also reviewed my presentation, gave me some feedback. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, these two individuals for helping me uh, with the review uh, of this presentation. So by the end of this webinar, uh, you should understand the differences between conventional and fixed block signaling, conventional fixed block signaling and moving blocks. So that you should have a firm grasp of what, what that is by the end of this uh, webinar itself. You should grab the main, uh, grab the main CBTC architecture that are utilized in the industry, their advantages and disadvantages, and you'll have a very good understanding of 1474.1. This presentation is based mainly off of that standard. Uh, basically, what I've done is I've, I've taken out the more important aspects of 1474.1 and presented it here in my, in my own words. Um, but you should have a firm grasp of 1474.1, which is the main standard for CBTC. Um, if you can understand that, you can understand what CBTC uh, is all about. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a CBTC specialist. I've been doing this for over 15 years. Uh, I've worked as a CBTC designer for about 15 years at Talus, um, and then uh, three years as a consultant at Parsons, and I've been an independent consultant over the last uh, three years. My company name is CBTC uh, Solutions. Some of the projects I've worked on, uh, C Toronto Transit Commission, which is the current project I'm working on, which is upgrading signaling system from uh, the traditional fixed block to a moving block, Mecca Metro, Singapore, Edmonton North LRT, New York Airport in the United States, uh, Jacksonville, Las Vegas Monorail. Las Vegas was one of the first radio-based CBTC solutions in the industry, and Busan Gimhae in uh, South Korea. And I'm based out of Toronto. Uh, that's, <clears throat> that's where I live, that's my home base. So let's get started. So what is CBTC? So according to IEEE 1474.1, the primary characteristics of a CBTC system are, it's a high resolution train location determination mechanism, independent of track circuits. So there are no track circuits, there are no axle counters, it's basically the train determining its position and communicating with the wayside. Two, a continuous high capacity bi-directional train to wayside data communication system. Basically you're, you're communicating your position, the train is communicating its position to the wayside. And finally, uh, train born and wayside processes performing vital functions, meaning you can transmit your position, but at the same time, whatever you're doing, it has to be safe. So that is the most basic definition of what CBTC is. So going to a little bit more detail, the first characteristic of IEEE says the primary difference between 
a CBTC convention, CBTC and conventional is the ability to determine the position of the train independent of track surface. So how is that done? Usually there are tags placed on the track. Uh, for example, in the diagram, we have A, which is a beacon, uh, A, B, C, D, and they may be separated by a certain distance between them. It can be 100 meters, it can be 200, 300, whatever the designers decide they, they need. Those tags will determine roughly where the train is on the track, course position is what we call it. From the beacon itself, as the train moves away from the beacon, the, the train borne uh, speed sensors or tachometers will determine the fine position, the distance that it's moved from the beacon, uh, moved away from the beacon, say in this case 47.5 centimeters. Combining the two, the, the train borne equipment will know that it's moved 247.5 centimeters and it will transmit that information to the wayside. So that's characteristic number one. There are no track circuits, there are no uh, axle counters. It is basically the train determining its position using tags and its own onboard speed sensor to determine its exact location. So that's characteristic number one. Characteristic number two is once you, the train born has established its position, it needs to transmit that to the wayside. So it does that by using a communication link, a radio link usually. There's a, a, a radio on board the train itself. There are access points that are installed uh, along the guideway, could be every 500 meters, maybe every, every 1,000 meters. And the train will transmit its position to, to the wayside unit using this radio uh, medium. Uh, radio has become the technology of choice. Uh, some suppliers use inductive loops, um, but radio seems to be the way that everyone is, is heading towards. So that's characteristic number two, is to have a high capacity, bi-directional, two-way communication link where you can transmit, the where the train can transmit its location to the wayside. That's characteristic number two. Characteristic number three is, basically what it's saying is, it's great that you determine your position. It's great that you can transmit your position, but it must also be safe. Um, and IEEE has broken this down uh, into four broad categories. Now, I've categorized these categories. IEEE doesn't say it. They basically list all the functions you have to do, but I've, I've coupled them into four broad categories. Uh, the first is positioning, the ability of the system to uh, track the train safely and, and be aware of where all the trains are within the system itself. Determine the speed of the train and monitor it. So if it's going, uh, understand what speed the train is going at. If it exceeds that, the, the speed limit of the track, be able to stop it. Uh, determine travel direction, routing, and interlocking functions. Meaning, this is your traditional interlocking functions, which is you set the route, the switches are locked uh, for that train, and it's safe for that train to move along that portion of the track. <clears throat> and finally, IEEE talks about some miscellaneous functions such as work zones, door control, um, broken rail detection, grade crossings. Uh, broken rail detecting, that's debatable whether it's a CVTC function, and I'll go, that, I'll go into more detail in the CVTC uh, building blocks. But this is characteristic number three. It's saying that the, the CVTC system must be able to keep the system safe, uh, protect the riding public, protect property, and protect the personnel that are maintaining and operating the, the system itself. That is your definition uh, of a CBTC system. So now we'll go into types of signaling. This is where we talk about fixed block and <clears throat> moving block uh, signaling. So what you see here is two tracks. One is the fixed block signaling and the second, second is the uh, uh, moving block signaling. When you have a, a signal engineer in the conventional sense, the way they see the track <clears throat> is the way of showing it under the fixed block signal, which is the first, uh, first uh, diagram. They break the track up into a chain of blocks. They're all linked together with signals indicating when a train can move. That's how a signal engineer in the conventional sense views a track. For CBTC, <clears throat> a CBTC engineer, they don't see the track as a chain of blocks. They see a single contiguous track, continuous, unbroken, all the way along the, the, uh, the line. And that is the main, that's the biggest difference between the two types of signaling. Uh, how a signal engineer views the track and how a CBTC uh, engineer views the track. And they are very different <clears throat> between the two. So first, let's talk about uh, fixed block signaling itself. We have the tracks broken up into blocks, one, two, three, four. Uh, it has signals along the, uh, along the track, A, B, C, D, E. 
uh, each signal. Now, depending on the region, if it's North America, we have trip stops. I know in Europe they use these induces. Um, I'm not sure in India whether it's it's trip stops or if it's a, a induce of some kind. But there's some mechanism there to stop the train if it violates the red signal. Um, so you have trip stops is what we call what we call uh, trip stops themselves. Safety is determined by how far apart the trains will be kept, and that's basically within the block themselves. The size of the block determines um, the, the safety part of the system. Headway is determined by how many trains can pass through the system, and the shorter the block, the more trains you'll be able to push through that system. So that's the defining characteristics of a fixed block system. If we have two trains on the track, train number eight and train number nine, they're separated by one block. Usually it's a block or two for safety. I'm going to use uh, a two block separate, uh, one block separation or two signals. Um, and uh, there, as long as there's one block separation, it's safe and the train number eight will not move any further uh, from its location in block number one. As train nine moves forward, train eight is given its permissive aspect. It's given permissive aspect of yellow. It's now allowed to, to move forward into block number two. Um, it'll move into block two and stop at signal C. Uh, and as train nine and it move forward, there's, there's an accordion effect uh, of the train. As, as train nine moves forward, train eight follows it behind it. Now, the way fixed block signaling is designed is if the train were to violate the red signal, let's say train eight violates signal B, which is at red or restrictive, uh, the trip stop should stop that train. There should be enough of a distance or the size of the block should be long enough, sufficient enough, that if the train passed signal B at, uh, on a red, on a restrictive, the trip stop will, will uh, uh, release the emergency brakes and the train will come to a stop well before uh, signal C. That's the basic concept uh, behind it. And this is called the safety distance. I understand in India it's called the overlap block, overlap, block overlap. Uh, and that's the separation, and that's the safety that's uh, designed into a fixed block signaling system. The problem is, as train nine moves away from signal C, you're seeing this space created, and I'm calling it a wasted space. It's an artificial separation. And what that basically means is, train eight cannot move, it remains at, at signal B, as long as train nine is in, is in block number three, even though train eight can get closer from a safety perspective or a safety distance perspective or a block overlap perspective, there is enough safety distance there for, the, for train number eight to stop. But because of the nature of fixed block signaling, as long as train nine is in block three, train eight cannot move. So you have this larger separation that is needed uh, for safety, which is affecting your headway. And that is the main, main problem with uh, fixed block signaling, it's this artificial separation. It doesn't matter how far the train goes in, in block number three, that wasted space and that artificial separation, it continues to grow, but train eight must wait. It has to wait until train nine has moved completely into block four, completely into block four, at which point train eight will be given the permissive aspect and it will be allowed to move forward uh, in, into the next block up to block C. And then the, the effect continues, the, the accordion effect continues where train nine moves forward once it gets in the next block train eight is allowed to move forward but the point that i'm trying to make here is that artificial separation that's uh, that's created uh, is the is the is the problem with fixed box signaling that prevents it from allowing more trains to go through the system to reduce your headways or separation between uh between trains so the impact is as i mentioned the separation between trains is longer than required for safety and system throughput is affected so how how does that differ from CBTC signaling? Well, in the CBTC world, as I mentioned earlier, there are no blocks, there are no signals. Basically, all you see is a single contiguous track um, where the trains can roam free. They can go wherever they want, but the only rule is they have to maintain a safety distance. This distance is basically saying, if I have a worst case failure, worst case propulsion failure where the train acceleration just takes off, time it takes to, uh, invoke the EBs and the time that the EBs are actually at 90% uh, efficiency, that's your safety distance. It has to maintain that. Um, the train, train number eight will calculate that safety distance dynamically. So if it's moving at 60 kilometers an hour, it'll calculate what is the minimum distance it has to maintain uh, to, to establish safety. Now, as train nine moves forward, train eight follows it. There is no according effect. 
So you're keeping that distance to an absolute minimum, which is a safety distance. There is no wasted space. There is no artificial separation. The train, train number eight is following it as close as possible to train number nine. And as train nine, as the speed is reduced, train eight speed is reduced, the separation between the two trains also shrinks uh, closer together. So you're, you're keeping that distance as small as possible, regardless of the speed. It is a dynamic calculation, this, this safety distance. As train eight is moving at 60, the separation is longer. As it slows down, let's say to 25, the separation is reduced even further. So the, the separation between the trains is kept to an absolute bare minimum between the trains. And that is the main difference between moving block and, and, uh, and fixed block. Uh, many people assume that CBTC is there or the reason CBTC is selected is because of increased safety. That, that actually is a slight misunderstanding. CBTC is certainly safer. It has a few features in there that do make it safe. But fixed block signaling is a very safe signaling system. It's been proven over the last 140 years. The main reason why authorities, transit authorities, are moving towards CBTC is because they're able to bring these trains very close together, keep the system safe, and be able to move more riders to, through the system. It really is throughput. Um, safety between the two signaling philosophies is, 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 uh, is similar. They're both very safe, although CBTC is a little safer because of the speed protections that it provides and whatnot. But the main difference between fixed block and, and moving block is the fact that the safety distance is kept to a bare minimum. There is no artificial separation, uh, and therefore you can push more trains through the system safely uh, because of this, uh, this approach. <clears throat> so that's your difference between fixed block and uh, moving block uh, signal. So CBTC building block. So now we're going into um, what makes up uh, a CBTC solution itself. So there are, uh, there are not four, I made a mistake there. There are three high level functions there, uh, ATP, ATO, and ATS, automatic train protection, automatic train operation, and automatic train uh, supervision. These three building blocks are, are, are what define a CBTC system itself. So ATP, ATP is your automatic train protection function. Uh, this is considered vital and is safety critical. Uh, its objective is to protect the riding public, the operating personnel, and property. That is the main objective of ATP functions uh, in a CBTC system. It has priority over ATO and ATS, meaning if the ATO system um, were to break any of the limits that are defined by the ATP system, ATP will override it and stop it, either by breaking the train, emergency breaking the train, preventing train doors from opening, uh, uh, preventing a tra train from being routed into an open switch. Um, so that's the main purpose of a ATP uh, function itself. Uh, IEEE has defined 16 ATP functions. It's in chapter six of the standard. These are all the functions that are listed. I'm not gonna go through each one. I will go through, uh, what I've done is I've characterized these, uh, categorized these into four broad topics, but these are the 16 functions that have been defined by IEEE that constitute part of the ATP. Some uh, may be used, some may not be, but there are some that are absolutely essential, must be part of a CBTC system, such as the very first one, the ability to determine train location uh, or safe train separation, overspeed uh, and, and braking assurance. These are essential functions in, in the, in the uh, uh, for ATP functions. Some of those that are not, generally seen are at the, on the other side, which is your grade crossing, broken rail uh, detection. Some of these may be there, may not be there, depending on the architecture we have. So when you take those 16, we can break them into, you can categorize them into four broad uh, categories. Uh, I've broken it up into four. Uh, first is positioning functions. The second is speed determination and monitoring functions, travel direction, routing and interlocking functions, and miscellaneous functions. So positioning. When we look at the positioning functions defined in, uh, in IEEE, uh, it's basically what it's saying is that the, the train is able to determine its front position and its rear location. It's not just determining where the center of the train is, it's determining where the front and center of that, front and rear of that train is, basically the envelope of that train and transmitting that to the wayside itself. The second is these individual cars that form the train. So you usually have maybe three, four, five, or six cars 
that make up a train or a consist. Um, the system, the train, must be able to determine if that consist has separated or broken apart or is still together. So it's, it's the ability to determine if this train is in one whole or not. Uh, and the second and the third item is uh, for positioning is the, the ability to keep the train safely separated. So what it's saying is that the system is able to determine ex the exact location of every single train in the system and keep them safely separated so they don't get into an, a situation where there's a, a safety hazard or they're too close to, to each other or, or if there's a collision uh, of any kind. So these are the basic positioning functions that ATP is supposed to handle that IEEE has defined for it. Speed determination and monitoring functions. This is the ability to accurately determine the speed of the train. There are speed sensors on the train, a tachometer. Uh, depending on the rotation of that, the train is able to determine how fast it's going and the location of the train in terms of uh, fine resolution of centimeters. Uh, the system has to be able to determine the speed profile of the track. You have the entire track or the alignment uh, and, and the designer should be able to determine the speed that's permitted for each part of the track, such as on a straightaway, it may be 80 kilometers an hour. On a blind turn, it may drop to 60 or 40 kilometers an hour. The CVTC system has to be aware of that and it has to ensure that it does not exceed that speed limit and stop the train. And this is all done automatically. Uh, the third, the fourth point is uh, before a train departs a platform that there are interlocks done. So the train is at a platform. It must make sure that it's completely stopped zero speed, it must ensure that the train doors have, have closed fully before it, it departs and any other departure tests or that uh, checks it must do to determine if the system is safe to leave the platform uh, of a station and the ability to determine zero speed. So for ATP, for IEEE is basically saying for speed determination, these are the main functions that the, a system must be able to uh, handle. Routing, interlocking and movement authority functions. So this is your basic uh, switch interlocking functions or root interlocking functions. Uh, you're able to, the system is able to lock the system down if a route has been requested along the track. Um, the movement authority will advance only if the route is requested, meaning there is a reservation along the track. The route is locked for that track and dedicated for the train that it's been requested for. All switches in the path are locked and in a known position and no obstacles are on the path, such as another train, uh, or possibly tunnel ventilation doors, maybe they're closed. Um, you have to ensure that those are, those are open. Uh, or a closed track, maybe there's a work zone where workers are on the track, maintaining the system. There should be no obstacle in the path. And that's basically what this advance on the move authority is, is indicating. Uh, the third point is that uh, the, uh, it prevents conflicting routes. Although in a CBTC system, it, it depends on the design. I know that uh, IEEE is saying preventing conflicting routes. This is a more of a conventional uh, feature, but in the CBTC world, um, there are things you can do <laughs> to prevent conflicting routes or um, uh, in the system. And the final point is uh, the ensure that the train travel direction matches the commanded position, meaning the route has been set and the train is moving in the direction that it's been commanded to move in and that it's not moving in the opposite direction. And this is what I triple is saying for these for inter routing, interlocking, and moving, uh, moving authority functions. Finally, these are miscellaneous functions defined by IEEE, uh, work zones. This work zones is actually uh, a feature that some of the suppliers, um, it needs to be worked on is what I'm saying. Work zones vitally protect your workers at track level. Um, there's maintenance going on on every system around the world, some more, some less. Uh, and you have to be able to protect those workers along the track doing whatever maintenance work that may be going on. Reliance on procedures should be kept to an absolute minimum. Uh, it really should be the CBTC system that protects those workers along the track. What I've seen so far in the industry is these work zone functions, their basic functions with a heavy reliance on procedure. The, the, the industry hasn't moved to a, uh, a point where these work zone functions are truly vital with an absolute minimum number of procedures required to protect uh, workers at track level. So this is a function that's important that I, I have a feeling that as the industry matures, this function will take greater and greater prominence as more and more authorities demand that we, the suppliers provide something that is a truly a vital SIL4 work zone function. I talk about this in my white paper 
that you can download from our website, how to, a concept, a work zone concept that's a, that's a, a vital uh, design. And you can download that from my website. Uh, door opening and closing, this is basically for platform and train doors. Um, the train has to ensure that doors are locked while the train is moving. It has to ensure the train is fully stopped and aligned properly at the platform before it allows those doors to open. It must make sure that the platform and the train doors are aligned with each other before they open and they open in synchronous, uh, open in synchronous uh, with each other. Um, so it's, it's an important feature. It's an absolutely important feature because that is the main interface between the transit authority and the riding public is those doors. The amount of engineering that goes into those doors is absolutely amazing. Uh, I did not realize how important it was until I started this in this industry uh, 15 years ago. The amount of engineering uh, that goes into ensuring that those doors open and close, recycle uh, the ruggedness of those, of those doors. So it's a, it's a very important feature, as you all probably know. Broken rail detection. Now, this is a debatable function. This is a, a holdover from the traditional fixed block ways. Broken rail detection is not a primary function, even a fixed block signal. I know track circuits can detect broken rail, but that's more a residual benefit than a primary function. Uh, if there's a break in the rail, yes, the track circuits will drop and indicate there's an occupancy there uh, to determine if, if, if there's a, a rail that's been broken. But even a track circuit cannot detect all broken rails. If there's an inclusion in the rail, and the train is going over top of that rail, that rail can snap underneath that train. So in that case, it's too late for it to be uh, detected. A proper track maintenance program is needed to be able to detect broken rails uh, if you really want to do it properly. So since fixed block has this feature, it's been ported over to CBTC because there are some suppliers, because of their architecture, can detect it. But it's not a CBTC function. Uh, in, in my opinion, I know I triply says this, but in my opinion, it's not a CBTC function. CBTC by its very definition, what we talked about earlier, is the ability to determine the location of a train without track circuits. So broken rail detection is going to be a secondary auxiliary uh, feature that a transit authority can apply afterwards, but it should not be a part, a part of the CBTC itself. Um, but that's a debate that rages within the industry. I'm more on the side that it's not, a, it's not a feature of CBTC and that even in fixed block signaling, broken rail detection by track circuits is not the most efficient way to determine that anyway. You need a proper track maintenance program. And if you have that on a CBTC system, there's no issue uh, with broken rail uh, detection. Finally, level crossings. I triply talks about level crossings. Um, I don't like level crossings on a CBTC system. Uh, and the reason is this. CBTC systems demand control of the entire system. Uh, in order for them to be able to move as many trains through the system as possible. We try to restrict anything that can slow a system down. Level crossings slow a system down. They, 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 are, uh, they have to be, the gates have to be lowered for a certain amount of time to allow cars and pedestrian traffic to go through it, uh, which means CBTC trains have to slow down and stop in some cases while this, this level crossing is down. So it slows it down. Now, it, Level crossing needs to be there because it is a fundamental part of all track systems, whether it's urban transit or, uh, or mainline, so it's there. But authorities delivering a CBTC system who, who want more uh, performance from the system should look at maybe creating a bridge or going under the uh, level crossing itself. But it is a system that has to be, a function that has to be handled, uh, and there are CBTC systems that do handle it uh, and interface to it. So these are your miscellaneous functions uh, as part of ATP. ATP is vital. Uh, all of the rules or all of the limits that these functions are indicating must be followed. And if they are not followed, safety or uh, emer uh, an emergency reaction must take place or must be taken by the system itself. ATO. This is your automatic train operation. Uh, these functions basically control the entire train. Uh, they are controlling the speed, sorry, they're controlling the acceleration, the propulsion, they're controlling the braking of the system. Uh, they're basically taking control of the train that is usually performed by the operator itself. Um, but it is a non-vital function. So that may seem a little odd. How is it that an ATO, which is considered non-vital, is controlling a 50-ton train and is considered non-vital? Well, here's how it works. The ATO is controlling the train non-vitally, so it can do whatever it wants. 
Uh, it's controlling the propulsion unit. It's controlling the braking of the system. It's controlling the door opening and closing. But the ATP part of the, uh, the, the train board system is operating there as well. It's basically saying that the train is permitted to move at a certain speed. The ATO must, must honor that speed. If the speed is not honored and it, and it violates it and goes beyond that speed limit, the ATP will break that train. If the train comes into a, a station and the ATO decides it wants to open the door, but it's not safe to open the door, the ATP system is monitoring the ATO and says, no, it stops it. It prevents the door from opening. So there's a, a relationship between the ATO part of train board and the ATP part of the train board system. They're working in unison. Um, and if anything goes wrong with the ATO, the ATP protects it. But the ATO is considered a non-vital part of the train board uh, system, but it's controlling uh, everything that the train driver uh, is supposed to be doing. And that's essentially what makes it a driverless uh, system. So there are three functions that are defined by, AT, uh, by, defined by IEEE 1474.1. There's the ASE or the automatic speed regulation. Uh, there's the platform berthing, uh, which is the controls to have a train come into a station, uh, open and close doors and, and, and leave and actually the door control itself for train and platform doors. These are all considered uh, non-vital uh, functions uh, as part of IEEE. So automatic speed regulation. This is the starting, stopping, and uh, speed regulation of the train. It's controlled by the ATO uh, and it's controlling a propulsion unit. It takes the information from the ATP part that says your speed limit is 60 kilometers an hour and it must match that speed. If the train goes beyond that 60 kilometers, let's say it goes 62, 63, 64 kilometers an hour, the ATP system will, will automatically break that train to bring it under 60 kilometers an hour. So it's not going to drop the hammer. It's not going to emergency break the train. If that train goes past a certain threshold, so 60 is the limit, if it goes past 65, the ATP would drop the emergency brakes. So there's a certain tolerance that the ATP allows this ATO uh, in terms of, of regulating the speed. Speed limit is 60, you can go a little bit above it, but I'm going to break you back below. But if I can't break you back below the speed limit, the ATP will emergency break the train uh, uh, immediately. So the automatic, the, the automatic speed regulation, this is, it also controls how hard the train is going to accelerate, how hard it's going to break or decelerate, and the jerk that the passenger are going to feel. This is where ride quality, passenger comfort and ride quality comes into it. Um, this is where the suppliers are tuning the ASC uh, speed profile to ensure that nice smooth uh, acceleration when the train is taking off. And when the train is coming to a stop at a station, it comes to a nice smooth stop. So there's none of this jerking back and forth uh, as the train is coming into the platform and leaving the platform. And that's the ASC that does that. If some of you have worked on CBTC project, you'll notice that the suppliers are, are tuning uh, the ASC or the, the, the speed regulation system. Basically what they're doing is this, they're trying to get that ride quality to make sure that they meet the jerk requirements of the project. Uh, or they're tuning it because the train is, is exceeding the speed limit uh, this defined by the ATP. Um, it, tuning the ASC is actually a very time consuming part of the uh, testing program in the field that I've seen. Um, and it's a very tricky function as well. Uh, so that's, uh, ride quality is one aspect of automatic speed regulation. Um, and as I mentioned, the speed, and the speed is determined by the ATP and it must be honored, otherwise the ATP stops. Platform berthing and control. This is basically the ability to stop a strain at the platform. Uh, if you have platform doors on a station, the train has to stop within a certain tolerance. It can be anything between plus or minus 20 centimeters to plus or minus 50 centimeters. Um, so that's your train berthing and control. So the train comes in, it stops within this, this window and uh, it opens and closes the door, uh, including the platform doors itself. And that's your door control part of it. So that's the ATO function. So it doesn't have too much. Uh, in there when compared to the ATP, but it's a very important part of the uh, system because it is controlling that train. Um, and what it does affects the passengers on that train in terms of the ride quality that they're going to feel as they're moving along. ATS, automatic train supervision. So this is your 
central control. This is the eyes and ears of your entire system. The ATS sits in central control. This is where the operator is sitting in front of the workstation and they can see the entire system. They see the entire uh, line, all the stations. Uh, they are, uh, they can see the, all, all of the trains along the line and they see the routes and where the trains are and what they're doing. So this is the eyes and ears of the entire system. All trains, all wayside equipment, they're sending all the information to the ATS and the operators in central control. Uh, the, uh, they, they are generally monitoring the system. The system should be running automatically by itself, but they have the ability to override these automatic controls for various functions of the system depending on what's going on. Um, and the ATS is also considered non-vital. So if the ATS requests a route that is not safe, the ATP system, again, is going to stop that ATS uh, uh, from doing anything further from that. The ATS has eight functions according to IEEE 1474.1. Uh, I've listed them out and I'll go through them, I'll go through them in a little more detail uh, now. So we have user interface, train tracking, routing, automatic train regulation, station stop, restricting train operations, passenger information and announcement systems, and fault reporting. So user, user interface, this is the human machine or HMI used by the operators. It's a, it's a GUI base of graphical user interface and all relevant information is displayed on, on the screen. And IEEE is saying you must have certain information on there for the operators, which is just an obvious statement. Line overview, stations, trains, etc., cetera, uh, must be there to allow the operator to make the proper decisions uh, when operating the system. Train tracking identification. This is a non-vital train tracking. So when the train information is received uh, by the ATS, it is tracking the train. It's displaying the icon of the train so the operator can see where the train is. And it's identifying the train ID itself. So each train is unique with its own identifier and it's displayed on the HMI of the ATS uh, screen itself. Routing. Uh, the operators uh, have the ability to route trains based on the location reports of the train on the wayside. So if there's a train on the track, the operator can select the train, set the route to the next station, or advance the train forward. It has the ability to be able to route that train. Junction, and, junction management and prevention of deadlocks. So the ATS is the main subsystem that's uh, preventing uh, from the, the, the system from deadlocking. So what that means is when you get to a junction where there's a switch uh, or crossover, uh, the ATS has to ensure that the routes are selected in an order that prevents the system from deadlocking. You don't want two, two routes requesting the same switch at the same time and realize it's, it's locked or the switch is, is locked itself into position, but because there are two reservations coming from two different directions that the switch can't turn. So the ATS has to be aware of that. And that's called junction management. Uh, the ability to route which train first through the interlocking or not um, uh, to prevent these types of deadlocks. Manage the turnbacks. Turnbacks are a very important part of any system. That's what determines the headway and throughput of the system is at those turnbacks. So the ATS has to be able to manage it properly uh, to ensure that the trains are going on the right side of the platform when you want to launch that train. Keep the next train further away so it doesn't deadlock that, that switch. So deadlock turnback management is a is a very important part of the ATS and to manage it. Managing service disruptions. Every system is going to have disruption. You're always going to have a broken train. You're always going to have a passenger that needs attention, therefore that train is delayed. You're always going to have a switch that has lost detection and trains can't go through there. There's always a problem along the track that has to be managed. So the system has to be able to manage these disruptions. What that means is when the disruption occurs, the operators may take over manually to manage that system. But once the disruption has been removed, the ATS has to be able to bring that system back into equilibrium, meaning separate the trains properly uh, and maintain that headway. And this is an automatic feature of the ATS, so it has to be able to manage these service disruptions. And finally, the ability to route trains and storage lanes. I don't know why they mentioned that in IEEE, but um, yes, you have to be able to send the train to a storage lane, whether it be in the yard or on, the truck, or on the main line in terms of a pocket track or a siding, uh, you have to be able to manage it through there. Automatic train regulation. Uh, the ATS manages all the trains, so it's basically, it's a schedule, it's automatically routing those trains and has to regulate them, either using uh, schedule regulation or headway regulation. Schedule regulation is based on time. Train, every train must be at a certain platform at a certain time 
or it's headway, meaning the separation between the two trains that are there. And there are two, two uh, schemes that are used by the ATS depending on what the operator actually desires. Station stop functions. This is basically saying that the operator has the ability to st stop trains, start trains, hold trains, hold trains at a station, skip stations, uh, etc. Uh, restricting train operations, meaning you may want to put down a temporary speed restriction, um, switch blocking, track blocking, creating work zones, <clears throat> all done by the ATS because it's a central operator. They have controlled the system. They're indicating. Uh, the rules, non-vitally, the rules for those uh, trains that are operating on, on the track itself. Passenger information and announcement system. <clears throat> um, this is your, uh, these are your signs and <clears throat> auto, sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> these are your, your messages and signs that appear on the platform and the train in terms of audible or video or visual uh, messages. Uh, it's basically messages like the next train will be here in two minutes. The next station is uh, Vaughn Mills. Um, messages like that. It's an important element of any system because the passengers need to be kept in the loop. As a, as a designer, the passenger information announcement system was always a trivial thought because I was focused on the core functionality, train tracking, routing, speeding, uh, speed control, and whatnot. But from the operator's perspective, the passenger information announcement system is one of the most important parts of the system because uh, an unhappy passenger is a problem for the operator. Uh, they're the ones that have to deal with the complaints of, of uh, lacking information or misinformation. So for the operator, this is a very important function and, and suppliers need to be very aware of that. And, and most suppliers are that actually work on, on this uh, function itself. And finally, fault reporting. Uh, any faults that are happening on the system, whether it be on the train or the wayside, must be reported to the ATS. So the central control operator is aware of the, uh, the, the problems that are occurring along the track itself. So those are your building blocks, the ATP, the ATO, and the ATS um, that make up a CBTC system. But based on these three building blocks, uh, there are different CBTC configurations that you can have. Uh, many are assuming that there's only one type of CBTC, but that's not the case. Uh, the basic definition of a CBTC is no track circuit and communicate your position to the uh, wayside itself, uh, which means it's not a driverless system, CBTC, or an automatic system for that matter. It's just saying that you're indicating your position and you're reporting it somewhere. So you can have uh, three different configurations. One is ATP only, where there's no ATO or ATS. Uh, another is uh, ATP functions with some ATO and ATS, and finally, uh, a full ATP, ATO, ATS system, driverless, UTO, GOA4, all those terms that are out there, that's the final configuration. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with that type of a configuration. But the first two are also valid. <clears throat> so the ATP functions only. Uh, this can be a train protection and warning system, TPWS. <clears throat> Uh, that can be ATP only. It's controlling the, uh, uh, it's just ensuring that the train does not violate the red. It also looks at the speed sometimes in some cases. So that's ATP only. There is no automatic train operation or an ATS itself. In the, in the United States, they have something called PTC, positive train control. That may fall under the classification of ATP only. We have ATP function and some ATO ATS. This is again, you can have positive train control in the United States. It's able to determine the location and speed of the train, and it may be able to transmit the, uh, the location of the train to a central operator, which can display it to, uh, on, a, on a, some sort of an ATS. Um, and in terms of ATO, when it gets into a station, it may use its location and fine positioning to uh, open and close doors. So this is an example of of an ATP system with some ATO or ATS <clears throat> capabilities. And then you have the full ATP, ATO, and ATS functions. Um, and this is basically your, your fully automated driverless system. Some examples of that is uh, Delhi Metro Rail, Line 7, Kuala Lumpur, Kalanjaya Line, Hyderabad Metro, Sydney Metro in Australia, Mumbai, uh, and Kolkata in, in India as well. These systems are fully, uh, full CBTC, high-end systems, uh, providing full ATP, ATO, ATS functionality, and uh, 
most of the systems that are coming online, <clears throat> CBTC, are basically these types of, of systems. Architecture. So now we defined we've defined the foundation uh, of a CBTC system, which was the building blocks: ATO, ATP, and ATS. <clears throat> So based on IEEE 1474.3, we can have three types of architecture. There's a, a type one, which is CBI based, type two, which is no CBI, and type three, which is a train centric uh, architecture. Uh, now each one of these architecture uh, is going to fulfill all of the functions that are defined by the, the, uh, the building blocks I talked about earlier, ATP, ATO, and ATS. Sorry, let me rephrase that. It's going to satisfy most of the uh, functions defined uh, in the in the building block sections within the architecture itself, and I'll show you how that's done. So let's start with the uh, the first architecture, which is a CBI based architecture. Uh, you have your ATS, you have your wayside unit itself, and the CBI system along with the vehicle controller. This is your basic architecture of a CBI based system. Now. In this system, the ATS is, is the uh, system that operates the entire line. It's your eyes and ears that I mentioned earlier. Uh, all functions of the ATS building block that I talked about earlier are covered by this function, by, by this subsystem uh, in, in the CBTC architecture, in this architecture. The wayside, it controls the movement of all the trains. Basically, it's, it's setting the movement authorities. It's aware of all the trains in the system and it's ensuring that the trains are separated properly between them. So it sets the movement authority. Some ATP functions that I talked about earlier are covered by the wayside. And I'll go through that in a, in a little bit, what those functions are. The CBI, or the computer-based interlocking system, it contains all the interlocking logic. It basically is, it depends on the design, but it's usually um, using conventional fixed block principles inside the CBI to control these uh, interlocking logic uh, for the system. It controls all discrete IO devices, switches, signals, etc. It provides secondary train detection, and this box also does some aspects of the ATP building block um, that we talked about. The VC or the vehicle controller. This controls the entire train. All functions from the ATO are covered by the vehicle controller, and some ATP functions are covered by the vehicle controller here. So this is your CBI-based architecture. Um, sorry, and finally, you have your data communication systems, which is your radio link, your wireless link uh, between the trains, the wayside, and the uh, ATS itself. So this is your CBI-based architecture. Now, what you see in front of you here are all of the functions that I talked about in the building block section. If you recall, uh, for uh, ATP, we had safe train separation, we had end of track protection, we had work zone protection, restricted routes, uh, et cetera. So all the building blocks that I talked about are listed here, indicating which subsystem is actually controlling it. So in the case of the ATS, here are all your ATS functions that's controlled. In the case of the CBI, it's controlling the, the, these functions here, positioning, door control, routing, work zone, broken rail, grade, grade crossings. The wayside is controlling your safe train separation, end of track protection, work zone protection, your restricted route, and the vehicle is controlling the speeds, the position, et cetera, along with all of the ATO functions. This makes up your, your CBI. Now, what, what are the aspects of CBI, uh, important aspects of it? Well, there are two parts to this system. Uh, there's a CBI, uh, sorry, there's a conventional fixed block system, and then there's the moving block part of it, and the two are working together. Now, depending on the design for this architecture, the conventional fixed block can be the master and the CBTC is a slave, uh, and the second type of design, it can be the CBTC is the master and the conventional is the, sla is the slave. And this is an important distinction because it affects how the uh, system is going to operate and how the system and how the operator is going to to use a system. In the first case, where the fixed block is the master, um, the interlocking is defined for the the uh, the fixed block design is defined by the CBI and established, and the wayside will uh, will try to bring the trains closer together by uh, inter interfacing with the CBI itself 
um, to decide if it can bring these trains closer together. So in this case, the CBTC is, is operating um, as, a, as a slave. In the other system where CBTC is the master, the design is established for the CBTC moving block and the fixed block is put on top of it. So in this case, the fixed block is, is constantly requesting for permission from the CBTC in terms of what it can do or not. But these are the two uh, aspects of, of the design and it's an important uh, distinction between the two. The core moving block principles in this architecture reside within the wayside and the vehicle controller itself. That's where the moving block principles are. Um, and it's the interaction between the wayside and the CBI uh, which affects how the CBTC system is going to operate itself. But the moving block principles, they reside on the wayside and the vehicle controller uh, itself. In this architecture, interoperability between two different suppliers, uh, it's a challenge because much of the interface between the wayside, the vehicle, and the wayside and the CBI is proprietary, unique to that supplier. Each supplier has its own interface, has its unique abilities, uh, and for another supplier to interface with it uh, is a challenge uh, and it becomes difficult. Although I will caveat that by saying that in New York, they do have a system, uh, they have a spec, I squared S, that defines an interoperability spec between Siemens and Talus. So they've been able to do it and they are actually running a system, a line using that principle. <clears throat> but it, it is still a challenge in, in terms of using this architecture to do interoperability um, with another supplier. So architecture number two, uh, no CBI base. So what this architecture is, is saying uh, is that the CBI is removed from the architecture completely and all CBI functions, they are transferred to the wayside itself. So your architecture looks something like this. You have your ATS, you have your wayside, and you have your vehicle controller. The ATS and the vehicle controller characteristics, <clears throat> they don't change. But all CBI functions are now controlled by the wayside itself. So what you see here now is, in the previous uh, diagram, the uh, blue functions were part of the CBI. Uh, well, they're now part of the, of the wayside. So the wayside is now controlling all of these functions, which were previously the responsibility of the CBI. Um, and, and now you've basically removed the box and you have a wayside system. Usually in an architecture like this, there is no secondary detection. Uh, it is a full CBTC unhindered. <clears throat> uh, and the full moving block principles are, are applied here. Um, but you can have secondary detection in this. The wayside can do it. I've seen it done. I've done it myself. <clears throat> but the design is, is, is slightly different. So in this system, um, pure moving block system with no secondary train detection, as I mentioned earlier, moving block functions are shared between the wayside and the vehicle controller. Uh, but again, the, uh, the, the interface between the, the vehicle controller uh, the vehicle controller and the wayside is again proprietary to each supplier. Um, and for another supplier to come in and interface with it, it can be a challenge. I'm not saying it can't be done. It can be, but it is a challenge when you try to take the wayside from supplier A and try to connect it to the vehicle controller of supplier B. So interoperability is a still a challenge, although it's a little bit easier from the previous architecture. Now, type three, train-centric. So in this architecture, the uh, wayside is now removed um, and the vehicle controller and the ATS are the two subsystems that are, that are controlling the system. So this type of architecture looks something like this. Uh, the EC is the new f subsystem that's been introduced here. And it's basically what I call the element controller. It's functionally not the same as the wayside. Um, it controls field elements such as switches, points, or platform doors, but it does not contain any of the moving block logic like movement authority or routing. Uh, all those functions are now part of, of the vehicle controller or of part of the ATS itself. So the entire moving block logic now resides on the vehicle controller itself. Um, and, and the second thing that's introduced by this architecture is the fact that the two vehicles, vehicle one or vehicle controller one and vehicle controller two now can talk to each other or they, they are able to talk to each other uh, to determine certain information in terms of the location of that train. Uh, so this is the architecture for a train centric uh, solution. 
And in this case, uh, all the red functions, which were previously a part of the waste site, now all reside within the vehicle controller itself. So all the moving block logic is now sitting on the vehicle controller, hence the train-centric architecture. The ATS is simply monitoring all the trains, communicating with trains, giving them routes, but the vehicle controller is, is deciding when it's going to route it, what is the safe separation between trains, how far I'm going to go, when I'm going to request the switch to turn, um, when I'm going to open the platform doors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so all that logic resides on the vehicle controller. The element controller or the EC, all it's doing is basically telling the switch to turn when it's requested by the VC or open platform doors, et cetera. It is a very dumbed down box. It does not have any moving block logic on there. So in this architecture, trains are communicating with each other, VC to VC. Uh, the main limitation in this architecture is the bandwidth or the, the communication uh, uh, medium that, that's used, like the radio. Moving block principles reside within the VC itself, making it easier for supplier A to uh, interface with supplier B. Because, and the reason I say that is when the entire moving block principle sits on the vehicle controller, well, all it has to really do is, is communicate with the EC and tell it, move the switch, uh, reverse or normal, or tell the EC, open doors or close. But the moving authority or the routing is all on the vehicle controller itself. So if a supplier has a vehicle controller with that logic, another supplier, which can come up with the uh, EC, uh, which is simply a dumb box, to move those switches and platform doors. It becomes much more easier for interoperability. And this architecture, it, it can allow operators to select multiple suppliers uh, for, their, uh, for their system. Um, some of these standards organizations like IEEE and Sunilac, um, they should explore this architecture from an interoperability perspective um, and IRC as well uh, to, to look at this architecture for interoperability within the CBTC because currently uh, with CBTC interoperability is a major major item for many operators. Once you have a supplier on your site that signaled that line that's the only supplier they can live with because you cannot bring another supplier to to, to replace such, for example, the vehicle controller or the wayside. It has to be from that same supplier. The only exception is, is New York City Transit, where they have actually defined an interoperability spec, I squared S, and they are able to have um, a vehicle controller from Siemens communicating with the wayside of Talus, um, and they've done that. But it's a very unique, it's a very New York specific spec. They are trying to bring it into the into industry for whatever reason, it hasn't uh, really gained traction yet. Um, but personally, in the future, in my opinion, I believe interoperability is possible with a, a train-centric or vehicle-centric type of architecture. It becomes easier for suppliers to, to, uh, to create uh, an interface that can be compatible with each other. And it's something that some of these standard organizations, IEEE, ARIMA, Sunilac, uh, IRSC, uh, should look at and investigate uh, to see where that goes. So those are your architectures. Um, you have the uh, CBI-based, non-CBI-based, and the uh, train-centric architectures. Those are the common architectures. Uh, CBI and the non-CBI are the ones that are used currently, that they're the most uh, popular ones. Uh, the vehicle-centric, I'm not aware of any supplier yet. I know uh, Elstom has been trying to do something in, in the southern, southern part of France. They're trying to uh, deliver a vehicle-centric solution, um, and that should be coming online. I, I don't know when, but that's one. CBTC standards. So I'll go through this uh, fairly quickly. Um, so there are three standards. There's actually four, but I'm going to cover three. 1474.1, .1, and 0.3. Uh, CBTC performance and functional requirements, user interface requirements for CBTC systems, and recommended practices for CBTC design and functional allocation. So 1474.1, it's your main standard. Uh, if, if there's one standard you wish to understand, I would say that it's this one. It defines what a CBTC system is. It has the building blocks in there that I talked about, uh, ATO, ATP, ATS. It gives you general high-level requirements um, uh, that a CBTC system uh, should have. Um, it gives a basic description of the type of railroad that a CBTC system should operate on. And basically what it says, is it should be able to operate on any type of railroad, whether it's light rail, heavy rail, commuter trains, urban transit, 
um, mainline, it doesn't matter. CBTC should be able to work on all of them. So far, CBTC has only been deployed on urban, urban applications like subways on the inner cities. Uh, I'm not aware of any mainline application yet. Um, ETCS level three and four might meet the, that, that requirement, but I'm not aware if they've actually got an ETCS level three or four system operating yet. But it's supposed to operate on just about any system according to the spec itself. Uh, it defines the ATP, ATO, ATS functions that I've already talked about. Uh, it's covered in, in this spec. So ATP has the 16 functions, ATO had the three functions, and ATS has the eight functions. And it's described in, in quite a bit of detail uh, in this standard uh, for each one of these functions. Um, so that's, this is where you go, it's chapter six uh, of the spec itself. So that's your IEEE 1474.1 um, in terms of that. I'm going to talk about 1474.3 first before I go into point two because it, it feeds off of uh, point one, uh, IEEE 1474.1. This standard, it defines the performance and functional requirements that need to be satisfied by a CBTC system. Um, it, it basically defines the major subsystems that make up the architecture, which is what, what I just talked about, the three main architectures. It doesn't define the three architectures like I defined it, but it basically shows the various subsystems that make, make up the, uh, the architecture. And from there, you can insinuate the three different architectures that, are, uh, that can be used in the CBTC system uh, world. Uh, it takes each building block and breaks it down into further sub-functions. Uh, and each sub-function is allocated to, a, to the ATS, the Wayside, or CBI, similar to what I had done earlier. For example, I'll just take one example, uh, train location determination. Uh, it, it outlines whether it's a mandatory function, a vital function, uh, which substance to use it, who, who will actually use the input, who will create the input, etc. So if we take positioning, it says the, the beacons are going to define the position itself. The onboard calculates the position in terms of course and find position. It's going to relay that information to the wayside, which is going to vitally track all trains in the system that are, that are there and make sure that those trains are separated between one another. And finally, it's going to relay that information to the ATS uh, so it can display the information on a screen that the operators can see. And that's basically what this standard is saying. This standard is more for CBTC designers than it is for operators, in my opinion, because uh, it really goes into a lot of detail in terms of the, the functions and where they belong. Um, so I think this is more for designers than it is for operators. Yeah, so the standard is mainly relevant to uh, CBT suppliers and designers, not necessarily for operators. Finally, 1474.2. This is a user interface requirements for CBTC systems. This is important from one aspect, and, I, and it's mainly my opinion. Uh, it's from the maintenance side that I think it's important, but it talks about uh, three other interfaces. So this standard is basically talking about how is information displayed for the people that are operating the CBTC system. Um, so they, they've defined three operators, train, central control, and the maintenance personnel themselves. Uh, and how should that information be displayed to them. Um, so first it defines general user requirements. Uh, these are mainly best practices when you're designing an interface, which is not specific to CBTC. Uh, these are general requirements that can be applied to aerospace, automotive, or rail. Uh, they're more best practices. Uh, for example, the red is used for restrictive conditions uh, or a critical alarm or an, uh, a condition that requires immediate attention. So these are just best practices that should be used in terms of an interface, whether it's a window-based interface and, and, and where the icon should be displayed, whether it be top left, top right, et cetera. So the, the standard is basically taking that, distilled it and said, at least for CBTC, here are the best practices from other industries that we should apply. And that's all it's saying. So for the train operator, it uh, establishes the mandatory and uh, optional requirements that information should be presented. It shows the visual uh, indications, the audible and user inputs. So on a train, you have the train operator display. It's usually an LCD display. So the standard is saying what information is mandatory on there, like speed limit, the, the actual speed of the train, door open, close status, 
uh, et cetera. Um, so saying what information should be displayed on that screen and what type of alarm should be going off. Uh, alarms like an overspeed alarm. If the train is moving along, the ATO exceeds the speed limit, there's an audible alarm that should go off indicating you know, you, you've passed the speed limit, slow down. Uh, or, or otherwise the system, system is going to break or emergency break the train itself. So it just establishes what are the interfaces that are required. And one of the most common aspects of the standard is that it's saying it should be GUI based, not text based like a, a DOS prompt for those who remember <laughs> from 25 years ago. Uh, ATS user requirements. This section is referring to the ATS and central control, the workstation, what information is displayed on the screen, uh, like the alignment, the station, the train, train IDs, fault reporting, how it should be displayed and interfaced with. Um, it shows the visual, audible, and the user inputs that the ATS must provide to the operator itself. Um, so it just defines this sort of uh, information for the ATS itself. Now maintenance. This to me is an important part of uh, this spec here because um, it defines uh, the type of diagnosis and how it should be displayed. Because I, what I've seen in CVTC systems is, is the diagnostics capability from the operator perspective, they're, they're weak or, or they're lacking. Um, they certainly provide it and from the software developer, designer, engineer's perspective, they're beautiful. Uh, they can do many things, they can find many things. But from a maintenance perspective, is where the operators have to maintain the system for 30 years, it, it can be a different story. Um, so this section is talking about remote and local diagnostics. What it's saying is that you're going to have uh, rem remote diagnostics, which means there's some sort of a diagnostics machine or mechanism sitting beside the subsystem, let's say uh, wayside. It's in the equipment room. You go to the equipment room, you can diagnose what the problem may be, if anything. Uh, maybe there's something on the train locally where you can diagnose a train. Usually it's not. That's local diagnostics. Remote diagnostics is you're in central control. You have a machine that is telling you the status of the entire system. All trains, all waysides, all uh, radio equipment, access points along the track. Central maintenance terminal that tells you what's going on in the system itself. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, and what, not only is the fact that there's a central machine that tells you this information, but what information is being displayed, how it's being displayed is also very critical. Because when, the, when, when something goes wrong, that system will tell you uh, what's going on and has to tell you quickly and the operator or the maintenance personnel sitting there needs to be able to decipher the information very quickly, isolate the problem and send the personnel out to the location to be able to fix that problem itself. So, this standard talks about that and talks about the visual and the user inputs that are, that are required for it. This spec is basically saying that the interface has to be graphical, which it should be. Uh, it monitors all the equipment along, along the track, both hardware and software. The information that's displayed in this terminal, whether it be remote or, or in the uh, central control, uh, it has to be graphical at an LLRU level or lowest line replaceable unit. So what that means is, you have a workstation in say central control. Uh, you have your entire uh, wayside and all the trains and wayside are there. When you click on the wayside box, another window should pop up showing all the various uh, LRUs that are there, line replaceable units. And it should indicate which LRU has actually failed, maybe by showing it uh, uh, colored in red, saying that that item is the problem and it's failed. So from the operator personnel, they know where the problem is. Let's say it's, it's, on, it's in the equipment room 10 kilometers along the line. It knows which subsystem it is, the wayside in this case, and knows exactly which card in that sub rack is the problem. So if you can drill down to that lever, level, the maintenance personnel are able to isolate the problem very quickly and, and send their personnel out there to fix the problem. Uh, and this is the part that the operator should be really focusing on to make sure that the diagnostics of the system has this capability. And this standard talks about that. Um, and to go any lower than a, a, an LRU and you're going into too much detail, that's more engineer designer details, not applicable to the operator. And anything higher up uh, is, is information that's just too general. It's not giving you enough information to be able to figure out uh, what's going on. And the other important aspect is it should be a graphical interface. We are past the point of showing 
text-based information. That passed, that died 20 years ago. GUI, Windows-based Windows interface is the norm in all aspects of our lives, and there's no reason why our, our CBTC systems, when it comes to maintenance, should not be the same as well. And operators should be demanding that of their supplier, that it should be a GUI-based system, a graphical user interface-based system. The standard talks about date and time stamps for each event, uh, display a physical location of each subsystem. Basically what it's saying is that uh, the wayside system is located in equipment room X, which is located 10 kilometers down the line, or uh, the vehicle controller is located on train ID two, uh, so you know where that train is. Uh, and finally, it talks about something that's very interesting. It talks about uh, predictive maintenance. This seems to be picking up within the industry. I first came across it in Sao Paulo, line 17, a couple of years ago, where the operator was asking the ability for the system to predict a failure before it even happens. I'm not sure if any supplier can do that yet, uh, but it seems the operators are more and more requesting this capability. Um, so basically what it means is, if you have a power supply in your wayside control room, uh, the system should be able to monitor it and determine if uh, the power supply is failing based on voltage levels uh, and, and whatnot. So it's able to determine power supply X on the wayside is going to fail, replace it before it does. Very interesting concept. I'm not sure if anyone can do that just yet, but I believe as the industry matures, this will take on more and more uh, importance and a greater importance. Um, to be able to do predictive maintenance, it, it's, uh, it requires a design up front. It, it impacts the architecture and how they're able to gather all this information to be able to predict when uh, a part within the subsystem is going to fail. So um, I'm not sure anybody does it yet, but you should be aware that it's, a, it's, a, it's in the standard, it is there. Some are asking for it. Um, and s some projects may be, that you're working on may also request this capability and it's talked about in the standard. So, uh, so in my opinion, all transit operators should be familiar with 1474.2 along with 1474.1 um, because this affects the operator's personnel in terms of how the information is displayed. Um, the operator should focus on how that information is shown to the personnel because that determines how fast you can maintain the system, how fast you can recover from a failure, and how fast you can you can isolate the uh, the problem itself. So it's something that that uh, should be focused on by the operators. Um, I, I've seen many operators they don't tend to focus on this too much other than the ATS screen because that's where the operator personnel that's central control so they tend to focus on that quite a bit in terms of how everything's laid out the information they want to see fault reporting etc cetera, etc cetera. but when it comes to the maintenance side of things that focus isn't uh, that important isn't there that as it as it should be so operators if you if they're operators in the crowd you should take take note of of that Conclusion. So that's the uh, that's my presentation um, that that I plan to cover. Uh, what I've talked about basically is um, your your C the basic aspects of CBTC. I defined what CBTC is, a very basic system. We talked about what a movie block and fixed block systems are and the differences between the two. Uh, and the main difference being that uh, fixed block breaks the, the the track into chunks, whereas moving block it looks at it as a single contiguous track where trains can roam wherever they want as long as they maintain a safety distance. We've talked about the CBTC building blocks, the ATP, ATO, ATS. They're defined in IEEE 1474.1 in detail what those functions are. And uh, the most important part of it is the ATP, which is vital. It, it controls uh, the, the safety aspect of the system. If ATO, ATS do anything wrong, the ATP will prevent those functions from, from from going following through uh, with their actions. So it's the vital part of it. Uh, so those are the building blocks that make up a CBTC system. Um, we talked about the architectures. So the three different architectures, uh, CBI based, no non-CBI based and train centric, uh, they are um, the, the three main architectures that are, that are used. And uh, the CBTC building blocks that, are, that I talked about, ATP, ATO, ATS, the, the architectures, the subsystems within the architectures uh, 
contain one of those functions from the building block. So it, it feeds that into the architecture itself. Um, interoperability is a major uh, point that you should be aware of. Uh, uh, Train-centric, although it's not used in the industry yet, I believe that's the one that, that's best suited for interoperability between suppliers. Uh, and I'm hoping that as, as the industry matures and some of these standard organizations look at the uh, train-centric architecture as one that can be used for interoperability. And this is really, it's going to be driven by the operators. They're going to have to start demanding interoperability more and more um, in order to be able to uh, be able to go to multiple suppliers uh, uh, for a single line and not be a slave, be a slave to one single supplier itself. And finally, we talked about the standards, 1474.1, 0.2, and 0.3. You should be aware of 1474.1. Uh, that really is the CBTC spec. It defines what it is, what are the main functions. It talks about the building blocks and the basic definition of a CBTC. And uh, 1474.2, uh, that's important because of the information that should be displayed to the operator's personnel, more specifically, the maintenance part of it, uh, which I, th I think is lacking in many places. But the information that's displayed is important because it, it indicates how fast you can recover from a failure, how fast you can isolate the, the problem itself, uh, and that's kind of, it's the interface itself that defines that, or the, uh, the GUI interface itself. So that's the, the, uh, the basic uh, parts of my presentation. So thank you very much for attending, uh, and I hope to see you again.